Hi, everybody. Welcome to Oncology Data Advisor. I'm Kira Smith. I'm the senior editor at Onc Data, and today we're really excited to be hosting this panel discussion in honor of World Cancer Research Day. So I have the pleasure of being joined by a few members of our fellows forum and editorial board. Uh, we have Dr. Samuel Carrick, who is the chief hematology oncology fellow at the University of Miami Sylvester Cancer Center. We have Maria Badillo, who is the research nurse manager in the mantle cell lymphoma myeloma department at the University of Texas MD Anderson Cancer Center. And we have Dr. Matt Hadfield, who is the hematology oncology fellow at Brown University. Um, so thank you all so much for coming on today. I'm really excited to have this, this discussion and kind of shed some light on World Cancer Research Day. So to start off, uh, I figure a good intro question for everybody is, would you like to each um, introduce yourselves and share a little bit about the area of cancer research that you're most uh, particularly passionate about? Uh, Dr. Kerr, if we can start with you. Thanks so much, Kira. Thanks for the panelists for their time as well, for everyone joining the live stream. Um, uh, my name's uh, Dr. Sam Karip. Uh, like uh, Kira mentioned, I'm down here in South Florida. Um, something that's become of interest to me over the past few years and what I've seen clinically, um, especially during my training in hematology and oncology, is really um, the effects of air pollution and how they relate to lung cancer. Um, just a few hours ago, um, Professor Charles Swanton from the UK was delivering mm -hmm. the keynote address at the um, Longevity Survivorship Conference, where he was discussing a new mechanism that he and his researchers had found for particulate matter 2.5 and how it leads to a specific type of non-small cell lung cancer called EGFR mutant. Um, this is something that's very alarming, obviously, given our climate change that we're experiencing. I think just this week in the news, we saw that the um, progress that the US has made in terms of air quality has been completely erased and perhaps reversed by the increase in wildfires we're seeing throughout the continent and globally. Um, so this is something that I'm really hoping we can study moving forward and something that I think um, panels like these uh, are, are uh, wise to address and call for more research and funding. Great, and Maria? Good afternoon, Kira. Good afternoon, panelists, and good afternoon, everyone. My name is Maria Badello. I work as a research nurse manager. I have been working in clinical research for the past 15 years. I work with lymphoma and myeloma clinical trials, but more focusing on mantle cell lymphoma, which is uh, one of the rare uh, type of lymphoma. And Dr. Hadfield? Awesome. Thank you, Kira, and thank you uh, to both of you for the, the great introductions. It's, it's great to be a part of this panel. Uh, my name is Matt Hadfield. I'm, I'm currently a third year uh, medical oncology fellow at Brown University in Providence, Rhode Island. Um, predominantly, my research interests are in early phase clinical trials. So phase one clinical trials, um, mostly centered on uh, new medications that overcome immunotherapy resistance and, and novel immunotherapeutic combinations. And, and kind of my big area of interest dovetailing off that is immunotherapy toxicities. Um, we currently don't have very good biomarkers to predict who's going to develop immunotherapy toxicities. Uh, and unfortunately, our, our way of managing immunotherapy toxicities is still pretty crude, relying a lot on high dose steroids and, and very small scale studies. Um, and as we see more and more immune checkpoint inhibitors used in the neoadjuvant setting, uh, I think it's going to become more and more pertinent to a wide uh, array of patient populations, uh, both in, in solid tumors and hematological malignancies. So I, I hope to work on uh, more projects related to uh, identifying which patients will develop these toxicities and, and hopefully lead to better outcomes for, for cancer patients. Awesome. These are all such important areas of research, and I'm looking forward to hearing more about you know, your work in this field and you know, the progress that's occurred recently. Dr. Karif, I guess if you'd like to start on um, our next talking point, which is what progress has occurred in this area recently that you're researching, or what progress are you looking forward to seeing you know, in the next year or so? Yeah, absolutely. Um, so in addition to the context that we discussed a few moments ago, um, what's really been remarkable is this new mechanism that's been proposed by the group who I mentioned a few minutes ago. Essentially, what they found is that specific air um, pollutants that constitute particulate matter 2.5 can induce specific forms of inflammation at the cellular level. And this is what perhaps drives this unique subset of non-small cell lung cancer, the EGFR mutant disease, like I mentioned um, a few moments ago. So what What's exciting is that we've now seen this link. What is alarming is that there are changes that are continuing to happen um, that we need to help both um, pre prevent in the future, but also make sure that this is seen in a worldwide fashion. And what do I mean by that? 
The majority of the work that we've seen so far has come from cohorts specifically in Europe, um, especially in the UK, as well as Southeast Asia. Now, we do know that particulate matter levels vary uh, worldwide, and they are maybe linked with specific emitters of um, particulate matter, like um, diesel, coal, that sort of thing. So one of the things moving forward that I'm actually hoping to study, um, in addition to my collaborators at the University of Miami, is looking at that mechanism from the North American um, perspective. Um, and I think that would be really interesting Thing, both in validating the hypothesis, but also potentially paving the way for chemo prophylaxis. I mean, it would be great if you could imagine um, either IV or oral treatments that prevent lung cancer before it starts. Definitely. And Maria? Um, for me, when I started working in clinical research and uh, uh, at MD Anderson in 2008, uh, for mantle cell lymphoma, there were very few drugs approved for this type of lymphoma. The standard of care uh, treatment was chemotherapy with or without stem cell transplant. Over the years that I work uh, uh, in clinical research, we are, our team is very fortunate enough to see like five to six drugs got FDA approved, mostly oral drugs and a CAR T cell therapy. Um, so right now we are very, our team is very, very excited. Uh, we've been seeing new advent of new treatment such as bispecific, tri-specific and new other CAR T cell. And these are very promising for our patients. And um, I just wanted to touch also on, in terms of the uh, clinical team, you know, I wanted uh, and I'm really uh, passionate about to have seen some tools that we can use for our tea, for our patients in order for them to be easy to participate in clinical trials. Great, uh, Dr. Hadfield. Yeah, you know, as I mentioned, immunotherapy toxicities is something that's very interesting to me and something that I think we're going to have to spend a lot more time thinking about uh, and, and, and critically looking into uh, predictors of, of who's going to develop toxicities, uh, particularly as, as uh, these therapies start to trickle down uh, into the neoadjuvant setting. And, and, and to Maria's point, um, there's a lot more novel adoptive cellular therapies that are coming in the future, you know, CAR-T, uh, NK cell-based therapies. Uh, and as we start to explore these therapies more, where we gain an efficacy, we're going to have to manage the toxicity and, and really make sure that the appropriate patient selection is at the forefront of making clinical decisions. So far, there hasn't been a ton of advancements in terms of predicting who's going to develop, you know, particularly in the in the context of immune checkpoint inhibitors, who's going to develop toxicities. Uh, there was a very interesting study recently uh, that was published at MGH that uh, showed that certain HLA subtypes could potentially predict um, who may or may not develop a toxicity. And uh, also an interesting study published uh, by a group at UT Southwestern just uh, a couple of weeks ago showed that T cell binding capacity could also be a potential uh, predictor of who may or may not develop toxicity. Um, but we're very, very early on in terms of, of those types of predictive biomarkers and, and, and aiding and patient selection uh, criteria. In terms of managing immunotherapy toxicities, we know from large retrospective cohorts in melanoma, that steroids do reduce efficacy. I mean, you can imagine that if you're giving uh, a drug that's whole purpose is to take the breaks off the immune system and to fight cancer cells, giving large doses of immunosuppressive medications are going to uh, hinder that to some degree. And, and we see that retrospectively. Um, but there are some very interesting novel preclinical models with blocking TNF alpha and IL-6 that show that you can actually preserve the efficacy of an immune checkpoint inhibitor while uncoupling it from the immunosuppressive nature of treating an immunotherapy toxicity. Um, but we're very, very early on those, and, and you know, there's not a lot of trials uh, currently underway, so it's, it's an area that we really need to explore further in the, in the future. Mm -hmm. um, hi, Dr. Thanejim. So thanks for coming on today. Um, to catch you up to speed, would you like to um, introduce yourself and then uh, share an area of cancer research that you're most interested in or particularly passionate about? Thank you for having me. Yeah, so I'm Alankrit Adhanija. Uh, I'm one of the fellows from Roswell Park Cancer Institute in Buffalo, New York. Um, one of the areas of cancer research that I'm really passionate about is uh, the prevention of progression to multiple myeloma in patients with uh, precursor states such as MGUS and smoldering multiple myeloma. And um, there's a lot of experts in the field who are uh, looking at uh, you know, different modalities through which we can do this um, 
you know, there was a major trials uh, recently uh, presented, like the ASCEND trial, which looked at uh, chemotherapy uh, to cure, uh, you know, smoldering multiple myeloma so that these patients do not progress to multiple myeloma at all. And, you know, in a hope that we can uh, improve outcomes for patients with uh, plasma cell disorders. But more interestingly, you know, some experts uh, in the nation are also looking at some complementary uh, and alternative modalities that are, you know, shown to slow this progression. Um, for example, there have been studies um, called the Nutrivention 1, 2, and 3 trials from the MSK that are looking at plant-based diets and supplements uh, in patients with MGUS and smoldering multiple myeloma. Some of these trials do include obese patients as well. And, uh, you know, they're trying to see how intervening with whole food plant-based diets as well as dietary counseling um, can reduce inflammation in uh, these patients. And, uh, you know, some more data will be presented at the IMS by Dr. Urvi Shah this year, actually coming week, um, wherein she's showing that it's also slowing the progression uh, from MGUS moldering to myeloma. Similarly, we have some studies from Roswell Park where um, we have seen that using exercise um, in patients with precursor states is actually, you know, increasing the uh, T cell repertoire um, to a more uh, non-exhaustive uh, kind of profile, which implies that uh, these T cells are, you know, more active and more able to fight against uh, precursor state myeloma cells to limit their uh, progression to multiple myeloma. So I think, you know, uh, it's a it's a difficult patient population to study uh, MGUS and smoldering just because the progression is really slow. Uh, you know, most patients with MGUS progress at the rate of one percent per year if they're low risk, and uh, smoldering uh, patients do progress uh, more fast than that. But it's it's still very difficult to really capture those patients that are going to progress in the next few years. So studying you know these modalities in these patients is um, you know something very exciting that uh, we're trying to look more into. Awesome. It's definitely a really important patient population to study. Uh, we've had the pleasure of talking with Dr. Shah about the new prevention studies uh, a few times before and very interesting work. So looking forward to hearing more about that. <laughs> yeah, I'm, I'm really excited to see her latest research on, you know, exactly the progression. Uh, you know, so far she's uh, looked at microbiome and seen how bitirate levels and, you know, just surrogate markers of disease progression are increased in patients following plant-based diets. But in the upcoming meetings, she's actually going to talk about how the myeloma markers and how myeloma progression is delayed in these patients. So I'm looking forward to that. Great. Um, the next question for everyone, um, Dr. Kraft, would you like to start? Um, are there any messages you'd like to share about um, the area of research that you focus on in order to raise more awareness of it in light of World Cancer Research Day? Yeah, absolutely. I think there's one clinical take home and then one human take home, I'll call it. Um, the clinical take home is that the face of lung cancer is changing before our eyes. It's quite remarkable. And when I talk to um, oncologists from a couple of generations of training beyond us, I'm hearing so many more younger patients and so many more women being diagnosed with lung cancer. It's almost like there's an epidemic happening. And as we try to understand why, I really call for um, all institutions, researchers, providers who are interested in this topic to try to make a mark and understand what's going on. Like I mentioned, I believe air pollution is one of these drivers, and I hope I can understand that a little bit better in our continent. On the human side, um, and this can be uh, discussed at length in another setting, but I really think we all need to try to contribute to halting climate change. Um, we hear and just heard at the UN General Assembly during Climate Week that this is really an emergency in our generation and for those beyond. And I really urge everyone to take a look at their individual lives and see how they can mitigate that, but also appeal to their policymakers and other sorts of legislators to really try to make an impact here. Awesome. And how about you, Maria? Well, um, since most of my career as a nurse, I work in clinical trials. So <clears throat> I know some patients are very uh, uncertain or hesitant or very doubtful if they hear clinical trials or if their physician offered them to enter to a study. So I, I encourage our patients to ask questions. Uh, don't fear to reach out to your doctor, study nurses or coordinators coordinators, especially if there are questions that were not addressed during their visits. Actually, most of our patients are very grateful to participate in the clinical trial because they can have access to these new treatments even before it gets FDA approved. 
and clinical teams such as your doctor, your nurses, your coordinators <clears throat> are here to guide you and will help navigate any logistics or any protocol questions you may have. And definitely, you know, it's um, like I said, <clears throat> you get to get have access before it is FDA approved. Awesome. Dr. Hadfield? Yeah, absolutely. I, I think I, I just want to echo that the, the conversation has been so wonderful so far. I, I think, um, you know, we think about diagnosing cancer and we think about treating cancer, but when we start talking about, um, you know, air pollution and how that may impact the development of lung cancer or exercise for, for uh, preventing the development of myeloma, I mean, you really start to see this, the holistic approach to cancer care and, and, and really how we're all interconnected and, and how Maria talks about the, the clinical trial teams and how they're so integral to um, to treating uh, patients, it's just, it's, it's great to hear. I think with regards to immunotherapy toxicities, I, I, I can't say enough that I, I really think everyone's gonna care a lot more about these as they trickle into the neoadjuvant setting. I think as we uh, start to unfortunately see, and we've all seen it before, uh, patients develop immunotherapy toxicities and then take away a potentially life-saving treatment that's devastating and that stays with you for a long, long time and, it, and you never forget it. Um, so the concept that we need predictive biomarkers to determine who's gonna do really, uh, well and who's going to do poorly with regards to toxicities is, is really important right now. I would also echo that I, I think immunotherapy toxicities is not something that just oncologists manage. Everyone has to have a high uh, clinical suspicion for diagnosing these types of toxicities. It, it really is primary care physicians, hospitalists, every subspecialty, um, surgical subspecialties. Uh, everyone sees these. Uh, we all have anecdotal stories of how they've gone misdiagnosed, missed, uh, patients didn't get steroids fast enough. So I think this is an area that's it's really exploding with all the FDA indications with regards to immune checkpoint inhibitors. And, and I would hope to just raise awareness that it's a really important issue that we're all going to have to deal with. Awesome. And Dr. Tanasia? Yeah, I would just like to echo everyone's thoughts here about, um, you know, um, how, how, how we should think bigger, you know, the bigger picture when it comes to uh, preventing and uh, reducing the progression of cancer. And, um, you know, more and more, we are looking at more complementary uh, modalities being used. Um, and, you know, in the past, um, we generally believed that these were, you know, not really affecting the cancer per se, but, you know, sometimes it would help, help with the uh, side effects from treatment are, uh, you know, uh, just coping with treatment, uh, you know, providing uh, uh, you know, some stress reduction modalities to provide support, you know, and support and things like that. But uh, more and more, we, we are now investigating whether, you know, uh, things like diet, exercise, stress reduction are affecting the progression of cancer at the cellular level and at the immune level. And, you know, I think patients should really uh, ask their doctors more about um, these um, in, in adjunct to their uh, chemotherapy uh, and other treatments that they're getting so that, you know, they can uh, not only feel better, but also maybe have a chance to reduce the progression of their cancers. Absolutely. As we wrap up, any uh, parting words any of you have or anything else you'd like to mention? If, if you don't mind, I just really wanted to compliment my colleagues here. Um, I'm feeling really enthused by their research directions as well, um, whether it's from the clinical trial side to toxicity management or to my favorite field prevention. Um, I think this is just wonderful, the work you're doing. Um, I congratulate you and best of luck to you all. Well, thank you all so much for coming on this panel today and telling us about your passion for cancer research and all your efforts in this field and on the all the ongoing efforts by everyone else. Uh, it's definitely really inspiring to hear all about the progress that's occurred and that's you know expected to, to occur in the coming future. Uh, so thank you to everybody for watching this discussion. We really appreciate you joining in today. Um, be sure to follow Oncology Data Advisor at oncdata.com, um, as well as on YouTube or Twitter for more oncology news and interviews. Um, definitely have some more really exciting panels like this planned for the next few months. Um, so thank you again and hope everybody has a great day.